I'll give you a tiny example of what I mean. Um, we were asked to work on a project in Portland, Oregon, which was one of a series of little parks. And it was tiny. It was a 100 feet by 200 feet. I mean, it's a half of a park, half of a block. And it had a street on all four sides. I thought, eh, what do you, you know, so, but, and I thought, in Portland, what do you do? You can't, that's the city that Larry did this great stuff in, and Pete Walker was doing a project that was a nice project out in the Pearl District, and, you know, they had a nice Chinese garden, and they had a riverfront, and they had a lot of stuff. So I thought, eh, what do you do? What's needed? And, they, and the park blocks had all these ranks of beautiful elm trees that was, basically the dimensions of Commonwealth Avenue leading up to Portland State University. And here I was a block away from that with this basically vacant lot over what is six floors of a parking garage. What the heck to do? And I thought, well, the one thing you could do here that would be nice. Oh, and it was also a block away from Pioneer Square, the Portland Pioneer Square. So, hmm. Well, I think what it should be a more intimate outdoor room for people to come to. And if and if Larry is Beethoven, this should be more like a little Mozart sonata. It should just be a little piece, but one that's delight, you know, not heavy, you know, full orchestra, you know, but just a few horns and a couple of strings and a flute or something. So I thought, what's that in landscape? And I thought, well, hmm, I think two things. One is I want it to be bigger. I don't want to feel so squashed. So I decided we should pave the whole thing in stone because that's the only way to do that and just wall to wall from building face to building face across two streets to make it so that the cars were driving through the space and entering a space that was a pedestrian space and they had to mind their manners and behave themselves and that that floor should be very rich and very beautiful and I was in thinking about, I've done quite a few projects where I think about the, um, the origins of the people in the settlement and, the, and, and, and come up with paving patterns that were based upon things from Native American textiles but in this, or, in, or baskets. In this case, I, I started thinking, well, that, because I think of the surface as being basically a, a if it's a masonry surface, it is a textile of sorts. It's a fabric. And so I thought, hmm, if it's a fabric, uh, this one doesn't want to be all those polychrome things like I've done before in Denver and Seattle. It wants to be blonde because this is such a gray, gloomy environment. But it wants to look nice wet. Uh, and so I started, and I was kind of rooting around, and I looked at the baskets from the Columbian River area and that region and they were there was a lot of kind of blonde on blonde very pale beautiful baskets and I thought aha so so, so then I started looking at granites and figuring out how to do textures so that it would be this beautiful long elongated herringbone stone pieces that were ribbed and gave you this texture so that when it rained or was wet there'd be this shimmery pattern you know so that the notion that the floor of the city would come alive when it's wet, because it's wet there often. So that was that. So now I've got a stage for something to happen on. And then I've got these things coming up from the garage, fire escapes and smoke exhausts and elevators and stuff. And so I thought, ah, too, that's an awkward number. I don't know what to do. And, and I knew that cities, you know, people were primates, right? And we really uh, like, other gregarious primates like to be together and we like to eat together and watch each other and groom each other. And so the notion, so I thought it probably needs a little cafe. And that could be the third thing, so like one, two, three. And that between them then there's this kind of space is beginning to be shaped, right? So, and, but then because, but the, the site sloped about 12 feet or more and I thought, oh my gosh, it slopes a lot, what am I going to do? Mm, and <laughs> and because I wanted water, and but you know, and water runs downhill, and so I thought, uh, but then I thought, well, and why did I want water? Because people are attracted to water. Water is the blood of the earth. Water is what makes life possible. Water and the sun are the two things that make it all possible. So, so I just had to somehow, but doing water when Larry had done water until you know in spades, so so it had to be different. So it had to be jokier and lighter and more febrile. It had to be kind of flimsy and silly. 
So I, so, and so I thought, well, if it just came out of the pavement and fell back down to the pavement and then ran downhill, which it does, and then if I just gathered it up with a little dam in the shape of like the moon or something, it would make this crescent-shaped pond. And then you could actually sit on that little dam, and I could put a nice curved bench, and people could sit with their feet outside, or they could sit with their feet in the water, or they could lay down on the bench or whatever. So, so now the surface is starting to come in, but then, oh, and the tables and chairs are all going to be kind of crooked too. So, so that led to having to do a couple of terraces along one side, that these with feathered steps that stepped down from the cafe toward the fountain. And then I thought, uh, you know, we need trees because I've got to have leaves. I, I want shade. You know, we need some. So maybe I could do a grove over here, and we could actually put tables and chairs under it, and have maybe do a take some of the pavement and that part of the pavement. Maybe it's a big chessboard in this little grove of trees. And then you know, so now I've got the trees, I've got the water, I've got the floors come alive. But it's still, and I've had a cafe. Everything's going well, but it, you know, people. When they come there, uh, they wanted to read the paper, but it's just started to drizzle because it's Portland, Oregon. Uh, where do I, you know, so I give up. So I thought, you know, I've always wondered why in the Pacific Northwest they don't partially cover spaces like the great train stations of the 19th century and just have these outdoor spaces under a glass canopy because then you could have a square where people could sit outdoors, you know, because when I lived in the Northwest, we spent a lot of our time out on the veranda, as we would say, the porch. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd read, draw, write, do the Sunday Times crossword puzzle, eat, and do whatever outside on the porch because it was mild all year and we were out of the rain. And we didn't care whether it was raining or not. We we're still outdoors. So that led to the notion of this big high glass canopy over the terraces from the cafe. That then led to the notion of, hmm, what do I do with the water that comes off of it? And I thought, I tried to... I was going to take it and put it in the fountain, but that was against the law because they have some odd laws there that started out protecting people, but now are sort of slightly in the way. But so, so I took the water off of the glass, the big high glass roof, and shed it down into a big long planter so it's filtered before it goes into the stormwater system, and we can reuse it actually once we filter it. So there's this huge long high planter, and then I thought, oh, well, then I can just hang a bench off that and put tables and chairs in front of it, just kind of like those cafes in Vienna where you've got that banquette thing with the tables and chairs. And so this, this and, it, and I, I thought of it as like a parlor or like a drawing room instead of a symphony hall or instead of, you know, a park. Because, and there was no point thinking about putting down grass or lawn or flower beds or anything because there's just no room. You know, I didn't have any room. But there's these big planters full of gushy plants, you know, and there's these trees that are like a bouquet, you know, and, uh, and they're yellow woods, so that, you know, in the spring, they'll have, every other year, they have these great, great racemes of white blossoms about this long that hang down from them. They smell great, you know. And so the notion of, of producing a place that has water, texture, color, light, uh, food, drink, uh, entertainment, people watching each other, there's a little bit of theater, chess, they can play chess, and a big funny chess set with people, you know, watching what's going on. You know, um, you know, places to sit, places to move. It's got long views, short views. It's the stuff we're talking about. It doesn't look like nature. It doesn't, you know, it isn't nature, but it has some of the stimulus and attributes, but it also has some of the stimulus and attributes that we associate with good historic public spaces. To my enormous relief, uh, the city was wonderful in rising to the occasion and coming up with the money. There's a donor who gave us money for most of the park. The city was going to pay the rest, and then it turned out it was going to cost even more. We went back to him. He gave us some more money, and we named the fountain. They named the fountain. Uh, we asked him. The park's named after his parents, uh, and uh, the, then when we ran out of money and we needed some more help, um, he said he'd give it to us and we could name the fountain for something. And then when he thought about what to name the fountain for, he decided to name it for teachers. So it's called Teacher's Fountain. It's for, because he felt school teachers were so important in his life, especially grade school teachers, that this should be a thing. And so we have this more. And the kids all run around in the fountain and it's Teacher's Fountain where the kids are. And so, so the city has taken it up. They love this space. It's full of people, families. 
in the middle of downtown, suddenly there's all these kids in strollers and moms and everything. You think, where are they coming from? But that happens to a lot of our parks. It happened at Battery Park City. It happened in Bryant Park. It happens in many of our works where after a while you realize who's in the and it's old people, young people, homeless people, working class people, shop girls, they're all there. Do you want to give me a sound, an opening sentence sound bite where you've never said the name of the space? And oh. also, did you have a collaborator on that? Yes. So I, just so we don't get beaten up. Uh, um, there is a project that uh, might talk about some of the things I've been talking about, and that is uh, Director Park in Portland, Oregon. And it's a great project that I had the good fortune to work with several fabulous people from Portland, Oregon. It, there was an architect's firm called uh, Zimmer Gensel Frasca ZGF. Bob Frasca is an old friend, but it was basically several of the younger partners there who really got it done and worked it through, and they were incredible. And also we had a landscape architect who's a dear friend, Carol Meyer Reed, and she and uh, her associate uh, had everything to do with the, the helping us get the job, helping us see it through and get it built, and with the, the fabulous plants we have there. There's a, the cafe is maybe the smallest cafe with the most beautiful green roof with these flowers on top of it and everything. It, it's, it's a nice project. 